So embarrassingly, I didn't realize how much of a fan I was of Matt's work until I looked over his website the other day. I now know I'm wholeheartedly a fan. I really enjoy it in a lot of different ways. As a painter myself, I've always thought of the problems of painting as something offhand, as a distant fear. I enjoy painting so much, that's why I didn't want to put myself through that madness. Matt, however, takes on these problems head on. Matt is a problem solver. He does, the whole, he does this without being heavy handed and somehow doesn't let them weigh him down. All these problems can be summed up by a photo by Louis Slawler that we looked at in class the other day. It's of a Jasper Johns painting hanging on a wall of someone's house above very expensive looking monogram bed sheets. It's not bad that it's there. It felt like it could have been swapped out for 10, ten stuffed bear heads um, or something like that. But um, how is a painting like making a baseball card? Why do people with the most money have the least taste? Where do these objects go and what do they do? Later, later that day, as I looked at Matt's paintings online hanging in the, in the, laundry, in the laundry mat, it struck me that this was the, what painting should be. Matt was doing it completely right. It got me excited about painting in the way that good paintings can. The right thing to do is to make thrift store paintings and hang them in the laundry mat. It's so obvious. I couldn't call them intentionally bad, and I'm very wary of that terminology. I hate when people call thing, movies they like bad movies. What if they were just good movies? I think Matt, Matt pulls off this trick here. He makes conceptually rich, rich work without letting the concepts tear him down. He uses them as an excuse to have fun. What makes his paintings great is the same thing that makes many thrift store paintings great, that they are made with joy. The secret ingredient is joy, or deep sorrow, I can't really tell. Regardless, nothing is heavier than being told to make something with joy, so let's not aspire to that. But let's just take a moment and to appreciate someone who has managed to pull all this off. Please welcome Matt Offenbacher. Wow, thank, thank you. That was such a beautiful introduction. Um, I am super excited to be here today talking to you all. Um, and um, let's, let's just get started, because there's a lot to talk about. Um, um, so what you're looking at is um, uh, the, the eyes um, of a pop star named Kesha. Um, do, you guys, how, do you guys know who Kesha is? Maybe a show of hands? OK, that's a good number. Great. Um, I'm a huge fan of her um, and of her work. Um, and I wanted to start with her with this talk. Um, um, because she really has been an inspiration for me. Um, and there, a few years ago, there was a um, concert that she played in, in New York. I think it was like at Madison Square Garden or um, somewhere like that. And there was a review in the New York Times that um, Ben Ratliff, um, Rat, Ratliff wrote. I'm going to stumble over his name because I, in my head it's Radcliffe because I think of him as like craggy and romantic. But it's actually Rat, Ratliff. So Ben Ratliff. Um, and he wrote this awesome review of the show. I think he was really surprised by um, Kesha's performance. Um, and he wrote how um, he felt like Kesha, um, oh, there she is. Yeah, so this is, a, this is the album cover for her single, um, her hit single, We Are uh, Who We Are. So um, the review uh, talked about Kesha and said that, um, that she didn't take on in her performance the normal roles that you would expect of a pop star, um, that she was kind of clumsy, in her performing and funny. She was kind of dumb, um, but also like really creative. Um, and that, that she kind of found a, a space that was neither safe nor tran transgressive, but was um, operating in some unmarked space in between those two. Um, and then he, he ended his review by talking about um, a cartwheel that Kesha did during her performance. And, um, and he says that you know in her choreography, and he said that if it was like a Beyonce, um, concert or some other um, big pop star like that, you could imagine that the cartwheel would have been um, you know, perfect. It would have been this beautifully formed, like exercise, like rehearsed cartwheel. Um, and um, uh, um, in contrast, um, Kesha's um, cartwheel was uh, lame, enthusiastic, and joyful. Um, 
I'll just say it again, lame, enthusiastic, and joyful. And I remember reading this review and thinking, God, I really wish that's how someone um, would um, talk about my work. And I think actually that introdu beautiful introduction kind of did talk about it that way, which is awesome. Um, and um, th th this review and thinking about Kesha um, sort of a few years ago inspired me to um, come up with some kind of um, ideas about art production um, for, for another talk. And I wanted to um, share some of those with you and have them be part of this talk as well. Um, so the, um, the first idea is something I called um, enthusiasmism. Um, and I'm going to read this a little bit. Um, it's not too long. Enthusiasm. Oh, I should ask, can you guys hear? Because everyone hear me OK? Uh -huh. Yeah, OK, good. Um, enthusiasm is the opposite of coolness. An enthusiast is someone who is both overcommitted and underskilled. An enthusiast is someone who puts themselves in the positions of potential embarrassment who reaches out with a fervor which they have no particular reason to believe will be returned. However, I think it's this very excess of energy, this desire to connect and court disaster, which can be so effective at generating new forms, new ways of knowing each other, and new kinds of spaces for seeing and being with each other's particularities. A community of difference works by affinity and inclusion, by celebrating and bringing together um, peculiarities, kinks, inclinations. In a community of difference, we have to pay attention to what we know about each other and how we know these things. One way to build these kinds of communities, the simplest way, I think, is to work within the logic of and. And what I mean by that is like sort of this and this and this and this. Um, th this is the way I think enthusiasm works. I think it can be a powerful place from which to make art especially art which seeks to imagine new forms of cooperation. Um, so this uh, it was a um, page from a zine that I made for an exhibition that was about these things, about Kesha, about my love of Kesha. Um, and one of the premises of this um, was that, um, per, what if the, the dollar sign in Kesha's name, so that's, uh, actually she has since removed it, but. Um, at the time, she was writing her name um, like that. And um, what if that, 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 that symbol um, wasn't a dollar sign after all, but um, actually referred to, um, let's see, to a symbol that um, the, the, uh, the famous French psychoanalyst um, uh, Lacan um, used in his uh, writings. Um, and what this slide is, is just a, a collage that I made of um, a bunch of um, transcriptions of uh, chalkboard he, drawings that he made during his lectures in the 60s. Um, and that's him down in the corner, uh, although that was much earlier in the um, century when he was a sexy young guy. Um, <laughs> so you can see in several places this symbol, this S with the, with the slash through it shows up. Um, and Lacan, um, well, I don't claim to really understand very much about Lacan, but what I do understand is that um, this symbol, what, the way that he was trying to um, use it was to talk about something that is often translated um, as the divided self, or sometimes it's also called the, the barred subject. Um, and it was this notion that our, our sense of ourselves, our a, a formation of our identity and self, um, goes through a process which for everyone inevitably divides us, creates this division within us. And um, what we're divided from is um, some little um, object of desire, something that, um, that, that's sort of our innermost um, object of unconscious desire. And it's something that we can never know what this thing is. Um, we're forever barred from knowing what it is, but it's the source of, um, it's what drives all the other desires that we have. Um, so that's the cons idea. Um, these are some photos from that exhibition that that zine was in um, of paintings. Um, it was a um, it was an apartment um, uh, gallery, which, which means that someone um, decided to make their apartment into an art gallery. So once a month, they removed all the furniture and had art shows just for one night only. Um, so for this show, I asked her to leave her bed in the space um, and just leave it unmade from the night before. Um, these paintings are on um, a fabric that I like using often that's called stained guard cotton. Um, it's like a thin cotton fabric that, uh, that you'd, you'd use like if you were sewing um, 
like curtains for a cheap hotel room and, and wanted it um, so that if someone spilled coffee on it, it would just beat up and rolled off the surface. Um, so there you can see the bed. Um, so this so this painting, um, which I think is such a, uh, oh look, I can look over here. I keep looking over there, but actually, I'm, okay. Um, is, uh, uh, I think an amazing image. Um, and I stole it from um, this book cover, um, which is a book that I love. Um, and it's um, from 19, I think it's 1980. Oh, I didn't write that down. Um, but uh, Joanna Russ um, is better known for her um, feminist science fiction writing. Um, you might have heard um, The Female Man. Is that the name of the, does anyone know? Is that her book? Yeah. Um, is her most famous um, novel, it's a science fiction story. This was her first novel, and um, it's, you know, I think like a lot of first novels, a thinly veiled autobiographical story. Um, and it's a wonderful, wonderful novel. Highly recommend it. Um, really inventive, and it's about a English professor at a college who um, falls in love with a woman for the first time and, um, you know, has a romance, um, comes out. Um, the, this is the illustrator who, who made this cover, um, T. Corinne, and I, I wanted to make sure to put her name up there um, because I think that one of you needs to um, do some research about her and write um, about her. She um, spent the, the end of her life in Southern Oregon and her archives are um, at the University of Oregon in Eugene, so not very far. Um, and she's an incredible illustrator and um, photographer. Um, she did a whole series of these book covers for the NIAD Press in the, um, in the late 70s and 80s that are, I think, really um, incredible. So someone to look into if you're interested. Uh, oh, and that's Joanna Russ, um, an image of her. So I, um, I, I'm going to show you the last page of the book. So if you're the kind of person who, this is a spoiler alert, if you won't read the book once you've seen the last page or something, um, close your eyes or <laughs> plug your ears. OK, that's your warning. Um, so these are it's actually the last two pages. Um, and I, I think this is one of the most like fantastic endings to a novel I've ever seen. Um, can you guys, can you read it from where you are? Yeah. Okay, good. So maybe just spend a second to just read, you know, maybe from the last paragraph down, like, you know, up from. Um, so, right, a footnote without a reference. Have you guys gotten to that part? So basically she, like, um, in her last paragraph of her novel, she has all these sort of asides, you know, comments on what she's saying. And then she kind of spins off into all these additional footnotes that don't even refer to the text. Um, and they're funny. Um, and the last one is very special, and it's for you. Um, and, I, and I just love this device. I mean, formally and um, literary, I think it's brilliant. And I was, I was thinking about when I put this talk together, why do I like it so much? I mean, I know I'm a huge fan of this, but um, I've never really figured out why. Um, and what I was thinking, I think the reason is that it, um, I was thinking about footnotes and how they're, um, they're often places, sites of authority. You know, they're, they're ways of framing a, a central text and giving it authority of different kinds. You know, in scholarly journals, it's really clear because it's often a reference to another um, person's work that is sort of boostering up the work that you're doing. Um, and in these kind of footnotes, it's often like an aside that's sort of trying to help support the main text. Um, so if you think about footnotes as a, as a place of um, authority, this idea that the, this site of this sort of marginal or framing site of authority could become a place, a playful place or a place where you could um, start communicating directly rather than just commenting on um, is one that I am really attracted to. Um, and I think that um, my partner, Jennifer, uh, often <coughs> jokes that this, this is probably the, the most succinct summary of my work. 
Okay, so the next idea um, that I had around the time of that um, Kesha review that I told you about, um, friction and resistance. <laughs> Traditionally, resistance means being against something and joining with others who are also against it to make social change happen. But the way I've been thinking about resistance is different. It's more like how resistors work in electronics by slowing, channeling, and processing power. This is a way of being against something that produces knowledge, knowledge that comes from proximity and engagement, from the feeling, the texture and friction between adjacent bodies. Pleasure should be a goal, as well as empathy and connection. I think this is a realistic idea of how art can make social change happen. So a, a recent project that, um, that I did, actually in collaboration with Jennifer, my partner, um, uh, that I want to tell you about, it was called Deed of Gift, and it um, was um, uh, an art project that took the form of um, a collection of artwork that Jennifer and I purchased um, using money that I won uh, from an unrestricted art award that I got a couple of years ago. So we used the money from this award and we went and purchased um, the work that you see on the right here um, and donated it to the Seattle Art Museum. <clears throat> um, the, the name of the piece, Deed of Gift, um, derives from this, um, the name of the legal contract, which is on the left, which um, is the standard way that ownership is transferred to the museum from a private collection. And it was, um, <clears throat> it, it, sort of, it's, it's, it sounds really straightforward when I tell it like that, but I mean, we've, we quickly learned that um, the, the ways in which artwork enters a museum collection um, is there, it's not a very straightforward process at all, and, and museums are highly selective um, about what they um, take into their, to their collection, partially, um, of course, because there really is no such thing for them as a free gift. Um, they have this, I think, rather insane idea, museums do, that um, the work that they are putting in their collection is going to be there for all eternity. Um, and so as a result, it's actually quite an expense that they have to anticipate for um, storing it, for maintaining it forever, um, and these sorts of things. So <clears throat> uh, we realized early on that to, in order to make this project happen, we'd have to talk to the museum first before we started buying work. And what ensued was a two-year-long process of um, negotiation with the curators at the museum to try to come up with a set of artworks that Jennifer and I felt um, like we really were excited about buying and a set of artwork and, and have that be also artwork that the museum felt like um, fit into their collection. Um, <clears throat> for me, the project was about thinking about uh, roles in um, art production and in, in sort of art systems. And um, I, you know, I, in, in my work, I've taken on lots of different roles to, in order just to, out of curiosity to explore them. Um, in addition to the traditional roles that are kind of offered to artists. So I've been sort of a curator or organizer of a, um, of a non uh, artist space, artist run exhibition space. Um, I've been a publisher and an editor and a writer, um, <clears throat> a sometimes teacher. Um, but this role, the role of a, a collector um, and donor to a major museum is one that is not um, often accessible because it requires um, money, essentially. So this. Um, award, which was $25,000, um, uh, <clears throat> was an opportunity to see really what's involved in that um, part of the art systems. Um, I should say also that Jennifer and I were super fortunate um, that we didn't need that $25,000 for our living expenses. Um, there's an aspect of this project that also is trying to talk about art awards and competition and, um, and what happens in a community when there's an over-reliance on um, these awards for actually sustaining people's practices. Um, so anyway, here's some of the work, a couple of the pieces that we gave. This is um, a, 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 a quilt by Joey Veltkamp um, called Glacier, Glacier National Park from 2013. And that's showing the front and back of it. Um, <clears throat> this is, these are four stills from a video um, by Wynne Greenwood called Young Woman Warrior Prepared for Battle um, that she made in 2007 with Nicole Eisman, the painter. Um, 
the theme, so, so the, 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 um, the, the parameters for the collection, the thing that Jennifer and I really wanted was that it would be work that was um, by artists living and working in the Seattle area. Um, and that felt important to us because we felt like the art, Seattle Art Museum um, had really um, dramatic underrepresentation of that in their permanent collection. Um, so that was something we had identified. Um, and the museum was pretty good with that. Um, and then in conversation with them, we also identified um, work that, had fe that has feminist and queer themes. Um, although I, I should say that the, um, the queer themes part was more coming from us and the feminist part um, was sort of more of the museum's interests. Um, and they still don't seem all that comfortable with the queer part of it. Um, um, although they, um, they did, so, so two years of talking and being like, well, this list and that list and comparing our lists and making studio visits and finally, um, just in this last, um, at the beginning of this year, we, we were able to get to the stage where we purchased the work and gave it to the museum. Um, and interestingly, the museum decided to uh, mount an exhibition of the work almost immediately, which was surprising to us. Um, it's not something they had to do um, and often don't if they get new work. They often tuck it away into the collection, um, uh, into storage for later use. But they, um, I think partially there was a lot of publicity around this project. And I think, um, I think also they were really genuinely excited about the work. So there's an exhibit up now at the Art Museum if you're in Seattle um, through the end of the year called Rebel Rebel um, that it consists of the work that we donated to them along with a few other things from their permanent collection that they already had that are thematically related. Um, this is an image of, uh, that's Joey Valkamp, the maker of that quilt, um, <coughs> giving an artist talk um, during an adult programming thing that the museum organized. Um, and this was really fun because Jennifer and I took it as an opportunity to kind of extend our project a little bit and we, um, we decided to um, host a happy hour for the artists of Seattle um, before the, um, the gallery talks upstairs. Um, so we, and we had some money left over from the award that we used for that. So there's a bar and a restaurant downstairs in the museum building. So we um, had everyone come and there was a ton of artists who showed up and everyone got slightly drunk or very drunk. And then we all went upstairs for these, um, these talks by the artists, um, some of the artists who had work in the show. And um, it was really, it was really interesting event. I'm still trying to think about it, but the dynamic somehow there was definitely a feeling of occupation um, that, or empowerment in our community of artists in a way that um, a claiming of the museum as a space for us also, which hadn't um, existed before. And I think partially because of that energy, the artists gave really incredible, really moving talks. And one thing that Joey talked about um, that I thought that it was really resonant for me is he was saying that he was surprised how uh, <clears throat> how significant it was for him that his work was now in a museum collection. This was, for several of the artists, the first work of theirs that entered a museum collection. Um, and he thought that, you know, he, 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 the, the legitimizing power of the museum was something that he felt really strongly and, and took him by surprise. And partially he said in this talk that it um, had to do also with his relationship with his father, which has always been really troubled around this, this um, decision that he had made to become an artist um, and a lot of not understanding of the, that choice. Um, and Joey said that the, the, um, the symbolic value of having work in a museum collection um, has, uh, has sort of begun helping to heal that relationship. Um, and one of the reasons I was really excited about what Joey said is that it, for me, it connects with this um, idea that I, this uh, thing that um, I've been really interested in with this project, um, <clears throat> and it's something that Andrea Frazier talks about. She's an um, American artist who um, is associated um, with um, what's called institutional critique work, which is this sort of very work of, um, of sort of intervening in art institutions and trying to make more visible the structures that um, make them operate in the power um, situations um, and um, and she's like and Louise Lawler also um, you mentioned in the introduction is another one of these artists who does that um, Andrea Frazier's idea and she's been writing a lot about this in in recent years and this is just my um, cartoon I drew last night <laughs> to illustrate it um, but basically what she talks about um, which I think is such a powerful idea is that um, rather than think about institutions as these um, 
as these external um, things, these external sources of power, like rather than, you know, and as artists particularly, although I think this applies to any institution, um, <clears throat> as artists, rather than thinking about ourselves and then the institution and, you know, trying to figure out what our relationship with that is, are we resistant, are we complicit, are, you know, are we angry, um, do we love them, are we all those things at once, perhaps? Um, rather than that external relationship with the institution, to think about the fact that institutions, the power that they have over us, um, is really the um, power of the internalized um, sort of set of um, uh, uh, systems that they embody that we keep inside of ourselves. So like the museum inside of me, the way that I understand the museum and its power in the, in the art community and art systems is really uh, an understanding of, um, is my own understanding of how, how that system works and, and, and how uh, my relation is to it. So it's really something that I construct inside of myself and sort of the sum total of a community's um, idea of what an institution is and what its power is in a community is actually what that institution is. Um, I think one of the things that that idea um, allows is sort of a new way of thinking about how you might change those institutions um, if you feel like they're unjust. Um, okay, let's see. Check the time. Okay, good. Very really good. Um, <clears throat> so, um, <coughs> many of you might know this, um, this amazing thinker and writer. Um, <clears throat> and I, I wanted to put this um, up because it's a quote that I really love and it's um, from an essay where she's trying to talk about what she means by queer. Um, and she, she talks about um, Christmas as an example of a, of a time when sort of all the institutions um, kind of line up with the same message, you know, like the, um, the, the, the store, the markets, you know, kind of saying the same thing as the, um, as the state, as, a, as the religious institutions are all kind of like together um, saying, Chris, you know, it's Christmas time and, you know, what that means. And it's, and, you know, I think it's often thought that that, that, um, that Sedwick is saying that it's often thought that that convergence of, um, of meaning from lots of different institutions is sort of what um, is the sign that there's something valuable happening, you know, that, that, that that's a sign that this is actually something really important for us. Um, and she's trying to say, but wait a second, what if, what if um, instead there were a practice of valuing the ways in which meanings and institutions can be at loose ends with each other? What if the richest junctures weren't the ones where everything means the same thing? Um, okay, I think I'm going to speed a little bit through these next slides, um, but they're, they're sort of, I, I wanted to say something about power um, and theories of power and, um, and, and in art context, one that's been really useful for me is trying to think about um, power as, um, uh, power differentials as a sort of potential places for play and pleasure rather than um, for um, defeat. Um, Audre Lorde also talks about this idea um, in terms of erotic power as being um, <clears throat> sort of the, the power that comes from sharing anything um, with someone else very deeply, um, which I, th I think is also sort of um, very related to this idea of enthusiasmism. And then um, finally, um, people often ask me, um, now that this Deed of Gift project um, has been completed, um, what, what's next in that kind of line of inquiry for me? And um, I actually do have another project that I'm working on that involves the Seattle Art Museum. Um, and they don't know about it yet, so don't, so don't, tell, don't tell them. <laughs> um, but it's, um, it's a more ambitious project, um, and it's really just in the research stage. But with my idea, it was, and it was inspired, the background for it is that um, the Seattle Art Museum in 2008, I think, 2006 actually, um, entered into an agreement with Washington Mutual Bank. Um, and it was a real estate agreement where um, the, uh, what, what resulted was the museum was able to afford to expand their downtown galleries and build these new, uh, really nice, um, uh, modern facility. Um, and then on the backside of the lot, the Washington Mutual um, was able to build a high-rise headquarters, a new headquarters for their um, banking operation, which they really wanted downtown. Um, 
The next year, Washington Mutual um, became the largest US bank in history to fail during the banking crisis. Um, and the result of this um, for the museum was sort of economically ca catastrophic. They, they still are trying to dig themselves out of the, um, the losses they took because of this um, failure of the bank. Um, so, so that history is specifically at SAM and, um, you know, sort of my own, um, like I think a lot of us, like um, real um, uh, fear about what the consequences of the increasing economic inequality in our culture is for our democracy. Um, sort of launched the idea for this project, which, which is sort of to try to find a way to transition the, um, the, the, um, the, the, the management or the, the leadership of the museum, the structure of the leadership um, from its current model, which like most American art museums, um, is it's ultimately run by a, a fairly small uh, board of directors who um, mostly consists of wealthy donors to the museum. Um, so to transition from, from that model um, to a model that more resembles um, a uh, cooperatively run organization where there's a large membership who all have some kind of say in um, the administrative decisions of the institution. And I'm interested in this uh, you know, as an art project um, because of, I think the potential for the symbolic value of this, you know, at the Seattle Art Museum as a civic institution and as sort of um, trying to embody some of the civic values of a place like Seattle, um, it, uh, it, there's some essential hypocrisy in, in sort of uh, the values that it, it expounds in its programming and in its galleries. And, and in the actual way that the organization is structured. And this is you know, typical of a lot of um, art institutions. Um, and so um, the thought is like how amazing, how powerful would it be to have a museum that actually was run in a way that um, was um, democratic. Uh, the, when I describe this project to people, this is the question that um, I often get. Um, and I love this question. This is one of my favorite questions. I feel like a lot of my work elicits this. Um, and, it, it, and I think it's a sign um, for me that I'm kind of ending up I'm somewhere that's pushing up against something, the edges of something. Um, and I wanted to share with you th these images. These are um, paintings by a, a painter named Keith Mayerson, who I love. I think one of the best painters that we have uh, currently in the world. Um, he, he lives in New York. And um, he, here, this is, there he is, he's cute. Um, <laughs> he, um, I think he does this thing, um, I, I'm so jealous of his work, because he, he does this thing, I mean, this, he does this, the Kesha thing, right? I mean, he has this joy and enthusiasm and, um, and um, lameness, but it's also, but, there's, but he also is managing to um, also add to that ma mastery, I think, or, um, uh, I don't know, I don't really quite understand it. I don't really understand how, uh, how he does it, but these paintings, it's kind of hard to see in reproduction, but in person you can see that they're, um, they're, they're really gorgeous paintings. I mean, they're beautiful, really amazingly painted paintings. They're, they're incredible. Um, so these are just a few images from um, the show um, at the laundromat that you heard about. Um, that um, I think also was a show that a lot of people had questions for me along the lines of, are you serious? Or how serious are you? Or are you serious? <laughs> um, this, show was a lot, this show was super fun. So, that, so you can see that's one of my um, paintings above the ATM machine. And um, they were all painted in my studio from uh, life. I, would, I was going to buy a bouquets at the market and taking them to the studio and painting them. Um, and they're all kind of, you know, they kind of resemble French painting from, you know, maybe the 19th century. Um, the laundromat had these, has, has these um, gorgeous blue walls, um, which I was really excited about. Um, and, the, and the name of the show was um, Flower Paintings at Lather Daddy Laundromat. Um, it's a laundromat that's on Capitol Hill near where I live. Um, yeah, yeah, so this show, I think, you know, it was a lot about audience, thinking about audience and, and, and what paintings are good for, questions about what they can do in the world. Um, 
and, and particularly the space of a laundromat, which is such a place of tedium and boredom um, and waiting. Oh yeah, that one's not a flower, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> um, okay, so um, here's the third idea that I had for you, um, perverse centricity. What would a queer world look like? I think it would be somewhere where perversity is especially appreciated, somewhere where the margins switch places with the center, or even better, somewhere where we can imagine the world without centers and margins. Taste and status would become disconnected from each other, as would the link between making mistakes and humiliation. Moments of not knowing what was going on would be great moments rather than disruptive or disturbing moments. Shame might no longer exist, and what would that look like? There would be a loosening of meaning from authority. Meanings would clump and gather, merge and separate across transformational spaces throwing off new meanings and ways of knowing. Um, so these last uh, few slides are um, images from a show that I have um, going on right now in Seattle um, at a gallery called uh, Veronica, um, which is an artist-run space. Um, it's, it's up until November 12th. I think, so if you happen to be in Seattle, it's, at the, it's right at the Mount Baker light rail station. Um, so it's easy to get to by public transportation. Um, this exhibition is called the V&A, and um, which is the Victoria Albert Museum in London, um, a museum that I love, a museum of decorative arts, um, a collection that was started during the Victorian era and has grown to rather immense proportions. Um, the V&A also is what I started um, calling the Goodwill store near my studio. Um, partially because I um, found that I was going there often and um, was going to the knick-knack shelves and they have, the, it's, a, it's a mammoth, it's like the big Seattle Goodwill, the biggest Seattle Goodwill. And they have this incredible knick-knack section, you know, with all those little figurines and um, I would, it would be really hard for me to go and, and not buy something, and then, but then I'd take it back to my studio and it'd kind of sit there and it, I'd be kind of sad. It would, be, it would make me sad to see it. Um, and so I was like, okay, well, maybe I can still visit the Goodwill, but if I think of it like it was a museum and treat it like a museum, then I wouldn't be tempted to buy things. And um, so I started calling it the V&A. Um, and I realized that there's actually a lot of similarities between the Goodwill and the Victoria Albert Museum. Um, such as, for example, they both um, have uh, you know, these large collections of decorative objects that are categorized by material. Um, so you know, the V&A has the glass rooms and the ceramic rooms and the, um, you know, the, the wicker basket rooms. And, and similarly, Goodwill by Isle has you know, all these things separated out. Um, and um, so the... Um, the idea for this exhibition, and, so, and, I, and for the past year I've been making these ceramic objects, so I decided to try to stage them in the gallery, sort of in a museum-ish kind of way, um, or an imaginary museum. Um, the other idea that I was thinking about um, for this exhibition is um, <clears throat> another psychoanalyst, a uh, um, British one this time, named D. W. Winnicott, um, who had an idea that he wrote about um, uh, something that he called transitional objects. Um, and for him, transitional objects were these, um, were the objects, you know, things like, um, oh, maybe I can flip through these images while I, yeah. Um, transitional objects were um, the things like um, blankets or teddy bears or, you know, all sorts of variety of things that um, infants um, attach them, you know, or attach to um, for a period, or, or babies for a period of time. Um, and his theory was that it was sort of a, a replacement um, for um, the mother's breast, um, a sort of way to a, a par part of the weaning process. Um, and um, the, um, the, the, his notion of these, of these objects is that they, you know, that they are the most important thing in a child's life for a period of time, but then, you know, sort of suddenly, often, at a certain moment, they lose that importance. I know I, I had that experience. Um, I had a stuffed animal duck um, that was really precious to me. But at a certain point, it was, um, 
you know, no longer um, had that significance. And Winnicott's idea is that the, the significance that's sort of um, infused into the, that, that particular object is in the growing up process kind of diffused out into um, all kinds of um, orientation towards objects and kind of the um, feelings that we have or the way that objects can um, embody or um, communicate feeling. So he, he identified it you know, pretty much as like the source of art or the desire to make things. Um, so I've been thinking a lot about that. So these are, um, so these are all ceramic um, objects. I haven't, I'm a painter um, and so I, had, I haven't made ceramic sculptures before this year, but I have a good friend who's a, um, Jeffrey Mitchell, um, who's an amazing ceramic artist in Seattle who um, was going on a residency and just offered his studio for me to use. Um, so, uh, and you know, it was great because he was like, you know, here's the, here's the, you push these buttons on the kiln and you know, here's a bunch of clay and here's some glazes and go for it. Um, so this was the result of playing around in Jeff's studio. A lot of the objects are inspired by my, um, my research trips to the um, Goodwill, the v &A, the Seattle v &A. This guy, um, all these objects around him are um, accessories, so you can, um, you know, give him different things to hold on to on his belly. Okay, um, thank you so much. I really appreciate it.